Uh, I'm Dr. John Brunstein. I'm going to be both um, acting as a host and giving the presentation today. Uh, and what we're talking about today is an introduction to cannabis mitoviruses, which is uh, hopefully I, I find a very interesting topic and I think you might too by the time we get through this. All right, so uh, first off, just a reminder, who is Segra? Well, um, hopefully most of you know, but if you don't, we are primarily a company in the uh, agricultural sciences and particularly plant tissue culture space. Plant tissue culture is a well-proven agricultural technique, which we think brings a lot of uh, good properties to the cannabis industry. It's good for maintaining uh, health, uh, both from a pathogen and disease perspective and health from a plant vigor perspective to plants, uh, uniformity of size, growth characteristics, uh, and scalability. Um, you can get very, very large numbers of very uniform, very healthy plants through this. Uh, and it's really, it, it works well in every other industry and it should here as well. And we certainly are big proponents of it and we have a lot of satisfied customers. We do have some very particular programs that the company offers. Uh, DNA fingerprinting is one for identifying cultivars and tracing cultivars. Everything from asking questions of, uh, you know, my variety here, where does it fit on a phylogenetic tree relative to other things to, I think maybe we mislabeled something. Can you help us straighten that out? And we've, we've had requests of that sort. And the answer is yes, we can uh, quite, quite quickly. We also do mother stock provision. Um, so then you can do gen one cuttings. We do full plantlet provision if you want to get rid of your mother rooms altogether and just go all TC and take that space and use it for production. We do regenerate and preserve, which is where you have a uh, cultivar that you like, uh, but maybe it's getting rather long in the tooth. You start getting plant senescence or uh, endophytic organisms or other issues. We can take that into tissue culture, clear it of endophytic organisms, um, regenerate a lot of its vigor and store it long-term. So you now you can get this back as kind of a more vigorous, healthy plant. And then we do something called the discovery program where we have a large catalog of cultivars and you can say, you know, we'd like to try a little bit of this, a little bit, of, you know, let's try some things and see what grows well and what our customers like. So if you want to know more about any of those, again, go to the website. The marketing folks will be delighted to talk to you and give you more information on those. A uh, quick bit about who's talking today. I am one of the two here. By the end of the talk, maybe you'll have come to a decision as to which one of those it is. Quick bit about my background. I did my bachelor's degree at Simon Fraser University in biochemistry a very long time ago. I followed that up with a doctorate in biochemistry at UBC where I specialized in the molecular biology of viruses. I did a postdoc at the University of Helsinki where I took that and applied it to clinical settings. And then I came back to UBC where I was a clinical assistant professor and I was on faculty there for 10 years. During a large part of that, I was the chief scientific officer at uh, what was called the Center for Translational and Applied Genomics, which was based out of uh, the Provincial Health Service Authority across multiple sites. And I oversaw development and rollout of a lot of different clinical uh, molecular biology and molecular diagnostics for infectious diseases and cancer and hereditary type things. I got tired of the bureaucracy of that. And from 2010 onwards, uh, went into private industry molecular diagnostics, both for other companies and running my own consulting firm for a while. And that was, again, molecular diagnostics and increasingly um, lab quality systems, which I got into out of necessity. I saw what happened when you didn't have good quality systems and it uh, made me a, a convert. And then back in 2015, I joined Segra as a nascent company and began applying clinical style uh, quality management systems and some molecular diagnostics to emerging issues in cannabis cultivation. And then going up to the top here, where am I today? Well, so uh, at, at present, I'm a part-time scientific advisory board member and hope to share some of my, uh, my thoughts and suggestions with Segra uh, to improve their production as they see fit. Okay, so what are we gonna talk about today? We have a, a number of key topics. Uh, first off, let's talk about what is a mitovirus. Uh, in order to sort of understand that, we're going to have to do a little bit of a detour then. And that's going to be into where did these things called mitochondria, where did they originate from? How does their genome differ from a nuclear genome? And wh why do we care? Why does this matter for mitovirus biology? Then we're going to, having understood that, we're going to come back and say, what are the key aspects of mitovirus biology from the point of a cannabis cultivator. And then we're gonna to get to probably the key question a lot of you are asking is, um, are there risks from mitoviruses? And if so, what are they? 
And then we're going to flip that on its head a bit and ask something maybe a little unusual. And that is, could mitoviruses actually even be beneficial? Um, as I said, this is a somewhat interesting topic and when it comes to plant virology. Uh, then we're going to go from that and we're going to ask uh, how do breeding strategies impact mitovirus because it turns out they, they do. And finally, at the end, I'm going to uh, go off on a little bit of a tangent and say, could we use mitoviruses to tell us anything else of interest about cannabis? And um, hint, uh, probably yes, or I wouldn't have that as a bullet point. So, so those are what we hope to get out of today's talk. So with no further ado, let's get into what is a mitovirus. So a mitovirus is a small RNA. And by small, we're talking around 3,000 to 4,000 nucleotides single-stranded. It's a small RNA which is capable of replicating itself in a very, very limited constrained type of environment. That constraint comes from the fact that the mitovirus codes for a single open reading frame. And for those of you who aren't molecular biologists, that's a single functional protein coding element. Um, most viruses have anywhere from, let's say, six or eight for really small viruses, six or eight ORFs, up to bigger viruses may have hundreds of proteins they code for, which make a very specialized environment. Mitoviruses don't do it. You have one and only one gene. And that gene is what we call an RDRP, which stands for an RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. Note that host cells, cannabis cells or human cells, uh, eukaryotic cells don't have RDRPs. That may be important for something we're going to talk about later on. Okay, well, single ORF, that means they have no other genes. There's no capsid, you know, the protein shell that most viruses make to get from one cell to another cell. They, they don't have that. They don't have anything else. It's one ORF. Okay, prior to 2018, it was really thought that mitoviruses only existed in fungi, and they were found to be fairly widespread in fungi, but that's it. They're only there. Okay, well, as a professional virologist, when I started reading up on mitovirus, the first thing that really hit me is that even calling this a virus is really a misnomer. We call it that because we have no other word in the English language to describe a replication competent nucleic acid, I'm going to say entity here. Later in the talk, I'm going to take a, a word used in another publication to describe it, another phrase, and say, maybe this phrase is better than the term virus, but virus is what we're using for now. In any case, mitoviruses are absolutely like anything else you would consider a virus. They really aren't. Where does the name come from? Well, the virus part is, as I said, because the closest thing we have for replicating RNA. And the mito part comes about because it turns out Mitoviruses exist only inside mitochondria and use the mitochondrial genetic code. So now we have to do a little bit of a, a segue here and ask, what are mitochondria and where did they come from? Quick aside, what we're going to talk about here was originally proposed by one of Carl Sagan's ex-wives, my name is Lynn Margulis. Uh, I went to a seminar she gave once. It was something out of the twilight zone. It was bizarre, as was she. Uh, however, this particular theory of hers is now very widely accepted. There's very good evidence for it, and it's, it's quite interesting. And it goes something like this. Uh, one nice day about 1.2 billion years ago, if I were Douglas Adams, I would tell you it was a, a Tuesday afternoon and at current Kensington uh, tube station. Uh, but the point is, about 1.2 billion years ago, two bacteria met up. And one of these engulfed the other one planning to essentially make a meal of it, but something happened and it didn't. Rather than digesting it, there was a symbiotic relationship that was set up. The smaller engulfed bacterium over time essentially gave up most but not all of its genome and became highly specialized at a certain class of energy metabolism. Adenosine triphosphate production for those of you who are, have a biochemistry bent, but the key energy metabolite of the cell. The host cells, by offloading this special function to the engulfed bacteria, got a huge boost in energy metabolism, but now became dependent on that source. So they had to have this endosymbiont producing energy for them, but in return, it did it very well, and they were very successful. The engulfed organism what we now call a mitochondria, in return gets a highly protected environment. It's not out in the big, harsh world. It's inside a nice, friendly environment in which it lives and replicates on its own, which is key, but it can't survive outside the host. 
Okay, so how do mitochondria spread? Well, when a cell, when a eukaryotic cell undergoes um, uh, mitosis, what happens is you just get a, uh, an assortment of cytosol uh, partitioning and mitochondria are, are, are spread throughout the cytosol and they just some partition to each of the progeny cells. So, and the mitochondria themselves replicate by binary fission, just like a bacteria, because effectively they still almost are a bacteria. Okay, so what? Well, it turns out you got lied to in biology class. Uh, as somebody used to lecture this stuff, I'll tell you, you got lied to it about a bunch of things, but this one in particular is of interest to us today. And that is that the universal genetic code isn't really universal. Some of you may remember this thing, it's thing with these code on tables and you look it up and oh, that three letter RNA code, bit of RNA codes for a particular amino acid at this position. There's 64 total codes, three of them are stop codons. And this is shared by everything from E. coli to humans. It's the basis of genetic engineering because you can take something out of a human and put it in a tomato or a mouse and it'll still express the same thing because we all agree on this universal genetic code. Only it turns out while the rest of the biological world got with the program and standardized on this, mitochondria didn't get the memo. And turns out they have evolved a slightly different codon table. And in particular, there are what we call stop codons. These terminate amino acid production. They, they, they're the end of the protein at that point. There are things that everybody else in the world uses as stop codon and mitochondria don't use them as stop codons. They use them as regular amino acid coding codons. So the upshot of this is that a mitochondrial gene cannot be expressed in a normal cell. It has early termination. You get short, aberrant, non-functional bits of protein doesn't work. Okay, so what are some implications from this mitovirus biology? First set of them. Well, no capsid, I already mentioned this. And this means no means of transport out of one of mitochondria to another. The replication occurs inside the mitochondria and they pass to progeny mitochondria during mitochondrial binary fission. These are genetically trapped and isolated to a single lineage within a single set of mitochondria within a single cell. And that's going to have some implications later on we'll come to. Uh, the one or the RDRP uses a mitochondrial codon table. So if somehow a mitovirus gets out of a mitochondria into a cytoplasm or nucleus of a surrounding cell, it can't replicate. It's non-functional. It's dead. It wasn't alive to start with, but it's, it's even more dead now. Okay, so takeaway number one. A mitovirus positive plant doesn't create risk of spread to adjacent mitovirus negative plants. Now, you could be the world's worst cultivator. You could have arthropods, insects all over your facility running from plant to plant and you're using dirty tools. That's, you're not a very good cultivator if you're doing that. Shame on you. You really ought to fix all that. It's going to cause you problems. But mitoviruses are not going to be one of your problems. Okay, You're not moving mitoviruses plant to plant. Implications number two. Uh, angiosperm plants, cannabis being an angiosperm, provide mitochondria to seeds only from the maternal side of a cross. This is kind of like humans where mitochondria come on the maternal side only. So takeaway number two is that mitoviruses spread uh, down generations through sexual reproduction, seeds, or if you take cuttings, right, that the cutting's infected. Um, but because of this fact that it's only on the maternal side, if you're crossing a mitovirus positive cultivar and a mitovirus negative cultivar, if the maternal plant is infected, all of the seeds will be mitovirus positive, all the progeny will be mitovirus positive. If the paternal plant is the infected side, but the maternal plant is not, seeds are mitovirus free. And again, there's gonna be something interesting later on, we're gonna say, could we maybe use that? Okay, so in breeding programs, there is a potential to include or avo avoid mitovirus in the progeny. Third implication. Uh, look, mitochondria, I already said, mitochondria are essential inside cells. They've, they've made this, this symbiotic relationship. You can't get a viable cell without mitochondria. So takeaway number three, um, for a lot of viruses with tissue culture, we can take a plant, we can take it down to a small amount of uh, essentially stem, pluripotent stem cell material, apical meristem, and you can grow this out. And because that was non-vascularized tissue, it didn't have these, these viruses, and you can now get virus-free material purely by sequential passage of small amounts of tissue and then grow it back up in a virus-free form. 
you can't get cells without mitochondria. The mitovirus is in the mitochondria. So standard tissue cultures can't be used to clean mitovirus out of a cultivar. But note, I used the word standard. And here's why. If you were to do this same tissue culture idea with a very small amount of cells, apical meristem, callus, growing on a synthetic media, and you were to put drugs in that media which inhibit RDRPs. Remember I said these RDRP genes don't exist in anything except viruses. So they don't interfere with the plant. If you put those in there, these infuse into the cells, they block replication of the mitovirus and a couple of serial passages over this, you might be able to get pluripotent plant tissue material, which is still your correct plant genetics, but doesn't have mitoviruses. And now you can grow this back up. Okay, so in fact, one group, now they didn't do this on a plant, they did it on a fungus, but in uh, 2021, uh, Shafiq, actually the guy's last name, I only ever knew that as a first name, but last name of the, of the, of the first author, Shafiq, Frontiers of Microbiology, uh, November, 2021, claimed to have done this with a, a fungal mitovirus. That's very interesting. The somewhat disappointing news is that the inhibitory drug they used was a uncharacterized green tea powder extract. It's probably the gal oil uh, catechol epigallate in there, which is the inhibitory drug, but we don't know what the concentration of that was. But it's in theory, it's possible. There are large classes of drugs which are known as RDRP inhibitors. They're mostly looked at for things like hepatitis C. So we, you know, we have 30 or 40 of these uh, available. Okay. Second takeaway here is that if any one sample of a cultivar, you have purple flaming space monkeys number seven, you test it somewhere, it's mitovirus positive, you don't have to test it anywhere else. Every other real example of that variety, clone, cutting, has it. it, it it's all or nothing. So, okay. So we know kind of what it is. What do they do to host plants? Well, at this stage, I would say it's unknown, but let me give you a couple of quotes. The first people to find mitoviruses in plants, this was Niebert, 2018, says the following thing. For plant mitoviruses in particular, their presumed association with mitochondria seems to make their potential for significant effects on plant hosts especially high. Okay, that's scientific cover your ass speak for saying, we don't know, but probably something and probably something significant. And we, if that turns out to be true, we told you so but we're not guaranteeing it. Okay, step forward four years and a group led by somebody named De Silvestra has a much more interesting quote. Quinoa lines hosting mitovirus activate some metabolic processes that might help them face drought. These findings present a new perspective for breeding crop plants through the augmented genome provided by accessory cryptic viruses. Okay, wow, I, what is this saying? Well. He's saying that this acts as a genetic element and maybe it does something. And I think it's worth looking a little bit more at what De Sylvester's group did and what they found. So let's do that. So they looked at Chenopodium quinoa. And yeah, that's the stuff you find in the health food section. Um, and what they found is that they, they were able to find two quinoa cultivars that were positive for a mitovirus and two other cultivars that were negative for mitovirus. Uh, they did some work. They show that the mitovirus was actively replicating. It wasn't just a bystander. It wasn't fungal detritus they were picking up. And then what they did is they did bucket biochemistry. They purified out mitochondrial proteins. I'm sure this was somebody's uh, thesis project in many long hours in front of a centrifuge. And then they took that and they did mass spec proteomics. So by doing that, you're able to assess the relative levels of, let's say, 30,000 different protein isoforms in your material of interest, which was mitochondrial proteins. And they did this in the uh, mitovirus positive cultivars versus the mitovirus negative cultivars and looked for statistical uh, linkages suggesting that there were particular proteins or protein isoforms that were up or down regulated. They came up with about 30 of them, which are shown in this uh, figure here. Blue is down regulated, red is up regulated. Uh, what did they find is that there was a trend of increased stress response associated proteins. So they kind of scratched their head and said, stress response. Let's try stressing these plants. And so drought resistance is what they did. They took their four cultivars 
uh, and a picture is worth a thousand words. Over here on the right, you can see uh, the right of the screen, the two plants on the left, which look all wilty and sad and miserable, are Chenopodium quinoa, which is, does not have mitovirus, and the plants on the right, which look healthy and fine, are ones that do have the mitovirus. These plants were all treated exactly the same, and their conclusion was pretty inescapable here that the presence of mitovirus made these plants much more hardy and much more drought tolerant. Huh, kind of interesting. Okay, but that's quinoa. We're talking about cannabis. We don't want to jump to conclusions. So what are the things that we can safely say here? Well, two things really. One, mitoviruses may have a phenotypic impact. They seem to have here. Two, it's not necessarily harmful. Again, let's not jump to conclusions, but we have to be aware that at least in the quinoa case, it actually looks like it was beneficial to the plant. Let's put that in the back of our heads. So what about mitoviruses in cannabis? Okay, well, mitovirus-like DNA sequence fragments, reverse transcribed bits of RNA that go into DNA, have been integrated, were detected in a bunch of host plant genomes going back into the late 90s. But a 2018 study, Niebert already mentioned, was the first to detect mitovirus RNA sequences associated with several plants. And luckily for us, hemp was one of the species they looked at, and they found it there, and that's what caught my attention. And then 2022, T. Sylvester, again, we just looked at that. Um, they expanded on this and they detected mitovirus in uh, a number of uh, cannabis cultivars. Sorry, the 2022 here is that, that is not T. Sylvester, it's, it's another study we reference elsewhere. Okay, but the point is some cannabis cultivars have it and some don't. Now, both of these studies used metagenomics. Metagenomics is where you take a material like a plant and you sequence all of the DNA, or in this case, RNA in it. And then you bioinformatically throw out everything from the host and ask what was there that was not host. Now, I have some experience doing this. Uh, and the, the weakness with this approach is that we know fungi have uh, 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 mitoviruses. And it's almost for sure that these metagenomic studies, there was probably low level fungal contamination on these things. How do we know that these mitovirus sequences were not from fungi? And I'm not gonna go into it here, it's quite lengthy, but both studies addressed this. It was the single biggest weakness. And they used things like uh, GC content and codon bias um, of the host versus fungi and have multiple lines of evidence which really strongly suggest that this was actually a plant mitovirus and actively replicating. And then, uh, well, DeSevester, showed that for the quinoa one in 2022 as well. So it wasn't just fungal detritus being carried along. So I got interested at this point in mitoviruses and cannabis, and how do we detect those specifically? So I looked, there were a handful of published sequences, uh, and this is what my history is doing, is developing assays in these canes, developed and optimized a real-time RT-PCR assay. And right off the bat, we had multiple instances of positive reactions. And I always really kind of want to Challenge my results. So first off, we confirmed that the amplicon sizes were correct. Real time doesn't tell you the size. So let's let's look at these. Are they the right size? Are they expected? Uh, yes, they were. So now let's pull them out and let's do Sanger sequencing. Let's look at the sequence of them. Make sure it's not some, something garbage. And right away, yes, they were between 90 and 98% identity to published cannabis mitovirus sequences out of these other couple of studies. The next closest hit was at 88% to cumulus lupulus. Hops, gonna be something interesting come out of that maybe. And then the next jump is right down, it's only about 50% uh, nucleotide identity to beta vulgaris or the beet family. Now, one of the questions you have to ask, we have a positive control for this. Is there some way that we are amplifying the positive control or leftover templates for our positive control reactions? Are these spurious false positives? When I design a positive control, I always engineer a small, uh, what's called an RFLP, an RFLP, a restriction fragment length polymorphism, basically a change of a couple of nucleotides in the middle of it to distinguish it from naturally occurring sequence. The sequences we amplified out here did not have that marker. We can say emphatically uh, that they are clearly not control material derived, they are real endogenous sequences. So we have definitively detected mitovirus RNA sequences in cannabis. 
what about the prevalence and what other observations do we have? Well, to date, uh, we've detected mitovirus uh, RNA in 79% of cultivars tested. That's 77 examined. And those 77 all have uh, multiple tests. N nothing there is just a single test result. Uh, but note that means that 21% of cultivars that we've looked at are mitovirus negative. Now we've kind of at this point stopped testing more because that percentage frequency really kind of seems to have locked in. Every new batch we looked at was getting around 70 to 80% positivity for those cultivars. And so overall population wise is around 75, 80% range. Okay, uh, the levels are very high when it's present. It's either there, plenty of it, or not there. And this makes sense from the biology. There's lots of mitoviruses inside each mitochondria. There's lots of mitochondria in each cell. You've got a lot of cells. It's a high prevalence marker. Uh, the levels don't change over time. So for instance, we had multiple time point samples on positive cultivars up to 13 months apart, and there's no change in load. And again, expected from the biology, this has been in that cultivar since that cultivar existed. It's at a steady state in there. It shouldn't be going up and down. And from a phenotypic perspective, none of these mitovirus positive cultivars have anything that you would pick out. They all appear healthy. Uh, there's no evidence of any sort of progressive pathology. In fact, they all are desirable cultivars. And I think there's some meaning to that and we'll come to that a little bit later. I really like to challenge myself. So again, at this point, we're looking at 80% positivity. And I again ask myself, are these real? Is there some way we're getting misled here? Remember I said that mitovirus-like sequences have been reported integrated in plant mitochondrial DNA. So I looked up some more on that. And some quotes here, this is Hillman, 2018, who's in turn referencing Bruin out of 2015, but integration into plants and specifically to plant mitochondrial DNA was itself an ancient event that likely happened only once. Okay, what does that mean? That means it should be DNA integrant copies of mitovirus-like sequences should be nearly ubiquitous. But remember, we see about 21% of our varieties is mitovirus negative. So we're not detecting something ubiquitous. It's either there at high levels or not there. And a significant fraction, one in five cultivars, doesn't have it. Second line of evidence is they're working with purified RNA. Um, and we see either a very strong signal or no signal. And this has, when I said we, all the results there of those 77 are off multiple tests. We have, ex, we have excellent reproducibility uh, because the levels are so high or zero. This is not a challenging marker and it's either there or it's not there every time you look at. If, uh, now when I say purified RNA, you could have trace amounts of DNA contamination, of course, uh, but those would be very small levels and variable. If this were or a DNA derived signal, you would expect to get a range of weak positive signals, not the super strong positive versus nothing that we see. Finally, last nail in the coffin, omit the reverse transcription step. Do your RT-PCR, but kill the RT step. Don't let it work and accept off of DNA. And when you do that, the signal goes away. So it is not a DNA derived signal. So the answer is yes, this is my last concern of how we could be getting false results here. And we put that to bed. These are real. So where did it come from? Well, my hypothesis is that mitovirus containing invasive fungi, we know that it's very prevalent in fungi. So you had a fungi with a mitovirus, and this is an invasive fungi, and it got into what I'm going to call a proto-cannabis mother plant. Why proto-cannabis? Well, we'll see in a second. And somehow this fungi lysed open and mitovirus RNA was floating around and there happened to be a mitochondrial fission or replication event going on right then. And one of these got inside that mitochondria and got captured. Now, this is literally an astronomically low probability of occurrence. But in biology, when you're dealing with millions of years over millions of plants, sometimes you win the lottery. And that's what I think happened here in an early cannabis uh, progenitor, a proto-cannabis. So when? Well, cannabis and hops are thought to have diverged about 26 million years ago. Cannabis became the freestanding, uh, free-growing, more like shrub-like structure. And hops needed other things like trees, and it was vine-like, and they started diverging at that point. Now, note that not all cannabis and not all hops carry mitoviruses. But I told you that we had a pretty good level of similarity, 88% uh, between the hops mitovirus and the ones we were looking at. So my hypothesis is that this 
miraculous event likely occurred shortly after the cannabis hops beginning of divergence, but there would have been a, have been a phase in there when some sort of limited cross-pollination was occurring. You were still crossing early kind of hops and early kind of cannabis, and they were having bastardly, not quite either of both offspring, which were differentiating more. So probably in the 20 to 26 million years ago range. For those of you who like things more in a graphic representation, maybe it's a little bit easier, it's something like this. We're starting off 26 million years ago, we have a plant which isn't really cannabis and it's not really hops, but it's starting to diverge. And we get this, this event here, this red flash is where this event occurs from an invasive fungi and the capture of a mitovirus. And what happens is as these species now fully diverge, say 20 million years ago, uh, now some cannabis varieties have mitovirus and some hops varieties have it. And over time, they've diverged a little bit from each other as well. Okay. Talking about sequence divergence, let's think about this. Remember that this mitovirus is trapped inside a mitochondria inside a cell. And a nucleic acid entity trapped in one lineage without a trans chance to transmit or mix would be expected to slowly diverge away. It's going to have mutations over time. And it's going to create sequence variants from what it originated from. And you know what? We see really strong evidence of this from our RT-PCR assay. We look at the melt temperature um, as one of our characteristics. And this, for a given amplicon sequence, should be quite stable. And replicates of, the, of a single cannabis cultivar, which is mitovirus positive, those replicates are usually about 0.1 degrees Celsius, plus or minus, which is kind of instrument error for the instrument we use. But if you go from cannabis cultivar A, mitovirus positive, to cannabis cultivar B, mitovirus positive, we can see jumps as much as like 1.4, 1.5 degrees, which was eye-opening for me. But again, we had the Sanger sequence data to show that, yes, these were, these were both cannabis mitovirus, and yes, they have sequence differences. So this fits the biology and shows that we are getting this genetic isolation within cultivars and this genetic uh, divergence. Okay, well, let's go and talk about something really weird here is cannabis mitovirus possibly beneficial? Okay, maybe not so weird in context of the quinoa. Let me just start with the following argument. We have a large set of selected and curated cannabis cultivars. We like these. These are not random ditchweed collection A. These are things that people like. They grow well. They have good uh, phenotypic parameters for their growth characteristics and their cannabinoid profiles and their aroma. Uh, you know, we like these. Of that set, a clear majority are mitovirus positive. And we know this didn't spread by plant to plant transmission because we discussed how this, with no capsid and whatever, and it's stuck inside a mitochondria, it can't do that. We know that it's existing in a steady state in infected, and I'm gonna use that term in quotes here. It's at a steady state. And maybe we ought to use the term accessory genetic element. Again, this isn't really a virus, but it seems that cannabis breeders have been selectively propagating primarily mitovirus positive varieties. So why would you be doing that? Well, now this is where the quinoa story starts tickling your mind and you say, could this apply here? Are cannabis mitovirus positive cannabis varieties, for instance, more hardy? They show drought resistance, maybe it's something similar. Another thing that occurs to me though, is that cannabinoids are thought to be related to the stress response in plants. The quinoa story, the uh, proteomic study highlighted stress response proteins as being primed or upregulated by the presence of mitovirus. And I'm wondering if the presence of mitovirus in cannabis primes a stress response and possibly boosts cannabinoid production. Well, it turns out it wouldn't be very hard to test this hypothesis or that it has some other effect on phenotype or vigor. Recall that and a cross between a mitovirus positive and a mitovirus negative variety, only when it's the maternal side which is positive do the offspring get the mitovirus. So we can set up what would be called a reciprocal cross pair between cultivar A positive here and cultivar B negative. You do female of, of A with male of B cross one, those are gonna be positive. And you do male of A with female of B cross one R, one reciprocal, these will be mitovirus negative, but they're really going to be the same, essentially the same cross, the same set of genes. And you grow up side by side, these two crosses, and you'll harvest them. 
and you look for drought resistance or whatever other phenotypes you want, uh, specifically, I'd say look at cannabinoid and terpene levels and see is there a significant difference. Finally, can cannabis mitovirus tell us anything else? Well, maybe. Remember we talked about the sequence divergence. I talked about the shift in, in melting temperatures. Um, if you were to go out and sequence a whole bunch of cannabis mitovirus, uh, and you get the whole genome, it's only, it's only 3,000 nucleotides, uh, from, from a whole bunch of different cultivars, and each one of those is a unique isolated entity, you should be able to use this to trace uh, evolutionary pathway of the maternal side lineage of a, can of, of a mitovirus positive cultivar. So kind of the, the graph there, you'd be able to see where things originated and which ones gained new changes, new changes, new changes. And this would enable you to do things like deduce lineages and identify uh, most ancestral varieties. Uh, those of you who are familiar with things like human uh, mitochondrial lineage tracing from maternal ancestry. It's the same idea. It's just this is a short, simple marker um, with a faster evolutionary rate than mitochondrial genome itself. So it might be very uh, interesting to do this here. Okay, let me finally get to the summary. What have we told you today? Well, from our results, about 80% of cultivars carry mitovirus as a steady state, and I'm going to call it an accessory genetic entity. I think that's a smarter way to think of it. Remember, a mitovirus positive plant does not create risk of spread to adjacent mitovirus negative plants. It's spread only through sexual reproduction, seeds on the maternal lineage, or cuttings or clones from uh, something that's carrying it. Um, it cannot be cured from an infected quote, quote, variety by just plain tissue culture. But again, the asterisk there, um, tissue culture paired with RDRP inhibitory elements likely can do it. It's been shown to be viable in one fungal uh, example, and I suspect we could do it here if we want to, maybe we don't want to cure it. Um, at least one plant mitovirus has been demonstrated to have a positive phenotypic impact. Kind of cool. Um, and what I just told you, that high prevalence in curated cannabis cultivar collections really suggests to me that positive selection is occurring. And final conclusions, if you've fallen asleep, now's the time to wake up. I'm going to hit you with the two, what I think the two big take homes are. One, should cannabis cultivators be worried about uh, cannabis mitovirus? And I'm going to say no. And there's three reasons. One, it's not spreading. Two, you probably can't do anything about it. And three, you might even like it. The evidence right now is you probably like it. Um, conversely, if you're a cannabis breeder, should you be aware of what cultivars carry it? And here I think the answer is yes. If I were a breeder, I'd want to know this. As more research uncovers phenotypic impact, good or bad, uh, it's possible that mitovirus status might be a meaningful marker. And because we have this choice of including or not including it in a cross where one, per, one parental variety is positive and one is negative, you could choose in that variety whether you want the offspring to be positive or negative, and choice of gender can be used to control that, and maybe that's going to be something of use. Okay, uh, well, we have a white paper which basically says much of what I said here. Some of you may have already seen that. There's a link to it. And again, email us. If there's something that comes up to you later or I don't get to, there's only one question right now. I think I can probably get to it. Uh, but if something comes to you later, please do email us and, and ask. Okay. Uh, so with that, so Ali Bektash, the quinoa experiment used different cultivars, yes, in comparing the drought tolerance of mitovirus plants, how do they control for genomic effects? Um, yeah, well, I suggest you read the paper, but what they're doing is these are not closely related varieties. And so I think they're suggesting that there are so many genetic differences between each of these four cultivars that the likelihood is that the only thing which was uniform on one and uniform on the other was likely the mitovirus thing. Obviously, there could be other genomic effects, um, but I would be very surprised if that was the case, given that they had such a, I mean, it was 100% linkage. Four varieties, small, it'd be nice to see more, but the uh, Occam's razor assumption at this point would be that mitovirus was probably the single most likely common genetic accessory element between the two of them. So, uh, but I see, go read the paper. It's a very interesting paper. Um, and I, I think really the way to get to this is the genetic reciprocal cross study I said, because that's the only way to get a large enough data set and enough diversity and really answer this. So uh, that's, I think, 
suggestive and preliminary, but it'd be nice to do do some real research here and uh, get some more data and, and really put this put this to bed. Uh, looks like somebody, Franklin Henderson said to say something, hang on, I'm gonna switch on your mic. Uh, yeah, Franklin, if you unmute, I think we can hear you. Oops. Um, did you say that you were working on a, a, a PCRSA for the um, mitovirus? No, I said we already had one and we had tested 77 varieties with it. Okay, gotcha with that assay, gotcha. Cool, thanks. Yep. Okay, well, I don't see anything showing up. So again, thank you all for your time. Oh, hang on. Uh, yeah, call it, so Nicholas Mathais. Yeah, CAMV is used for cauliflower mosaic virus. Is there another shortened name? Uh, not that I've seen. So, um, yeah, I, there's, I think there's a few other examples of uh, shortened viral names that conflict as well. So it's kind of a context thing. Uh, Ollie, again, nothing popped out phenotypically among the 77 samples. Uh, it's a good question. I have not looked at it closely enough. And going back to your earlier question about genomic effects, I would much rather do a controlled reciprocal cross where the genetic environment of the two sides is the same and ask that question. I think it'd be more meaningful. But the, the short answer is uh, no, other than the fact that of a chosen set of cannabinoid variety or cannabis varieties. Uh, we've primarily selected ones that are positive. I think that suggests it's a desirable trait or behind a desirable trait. Okay, well with that, I'm gonna thank everybody for their attendance. Uh, hope you had uh, a good time here and uh, we hope to hear from you again uh, if you have questions or in the future. Thank you all very much for your time and I will be closing the webinar. Hope you all have a good day.